Father, it's good to talk about these wonderful truths that you reveal to us in your word. Amen. Mm-hmm. This whole subject of salvation is, um, is beyond us in so many ways, but yet what you have revealed to us in Scripture is so refreshing and so sweet and so meaningful to our hearts because we have been the recipients of your great plan that has uh, resulted in causing us to become your children. We thank you so much for that. <clears throat> thank you for the time that we spent together in this class, Father, and we pray that uh, these men have had their minds and hearts expanded a little bit to the biblical meaning of salvation and, and uh, how you applied it to our lives and how we are now to live because we've been the recipients of your great salvation. Continue to bless us to that end, Father. Use us in all that we do to bring glory to yourself. Bless our class today, Father, as we wrap things up. We um, <coughs> commit these guys to you, Father, for your service. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So do you have any other questions about anything at all that we've covered over the last couple of weeks? Just to, uh, anything related to salvation? Even if it's out there sort of on the rabbit trails or the fringes or whatever. Anything you want to talk about? Yeah, one thing that just came to mind as you as a gentleman were talking about uh, is separation and the wrath of God delivering Jesus on the cross. Just thinking about like my sister and my niece and my father were up visiting this weekend and Skylar's three and like she said like she if she meets you, you're her best friend, and when she has to leave, it's like the saddest thing in the world, and she just, and she weeps, and it's hard to, like, pull her off a person. Yeah. I'm like, and I'm just thinking about, like, a picture of that, it's like, this three-year-old meets a person, and is utterly destroyed when she has to leave you, and it's like, she meets that person for three, and she hangs out with you for three minutes, yeah. and that's the case. Right. It's right. like, God knew, Christ has known his father all eternity, and then he was separated from him. Like, what, what an utter picture of, yeah, if a three-year-old can, pack, can picture that in mm-hmm. three minutes of meeting you, mm-hmm. like, now we've got all eternity we're talking about, and then he then said, then, then he has to separate himself from his father because of our, because of our sin. Yeah, exactly. And it wasn't like their relationship in eternity past was... Like our relationship was right. kind of up and down, you know, on again, off again. It was a perfect, perfect fellowship mm-hmm. for all eternity. Right. Mm-hmm. Never a disagreement, never arguments or anything. Mm-hmm. And yet it came to that point where God the Father said, I can't, I can't look at this. I'm turning away from my own son. It's amazing. Despite Christ knowing the Father was going to resurrect him, it was still having that separation for you know, whatever period of time it was that must have been. Yeah, and that that's really a good point. Good I, good a lot point. of a lot of people think that way, you know. Well, anybody can endure something for three hours, knowing what's going to happen ahead of you. Hmm. Uh, no, no, not not this. This was this was unprecedented. I mean. This was unique. Nothing that ever happened at this end. And of course, Jesus knew that Sunday was coming, but um, still, to go have his own father torn away from him. And for Jesus to just take all the sin, all of our sin, all of the mess that we've given him on himself, and, and mm-hmm. bore that, that penalty for us, it's incredible. Between that kind of anguish and physical pain he was in, yeah. you know, yeah. it's like yeah. it's just not fathomable. Yeah, not for me at least. Right. Yeah, the physical pain was was also intense. It was just mm-hmm. unreal. But yet, so that I, was yeah. probably the least of it for the Lord. Right. Yeah. So I use I like to use the lamb ram analogy. So <clears throat> Revelation comes back as the ram and military might yeah. where now that wrath is unleashed yeah. you know uh, same Jesus but just a different uh, just the horrible things that are going to go down yeah. and, uh, 
the, our, our message today was the sower and the seed. You know, mm -hmm. Awesome. So, question. So, who controls the soil? Who's behind mm -hmm. each specific seed that mm -hmm. is foreknown? Mm -hmm. you know, this opens up a whole mm -hmm. thing. So, you know, we've got to do our part because we like to, the, our statements don't know, you know, we don't know. We got to do our part. We got to preach in season, out of season, to to the reprobates, because we don't know who, and just go on doing. And that glorifies the Lord, just to talking about Him and witness about Him, even though maybe we don't see the results, so that we don't ever want to get frustrated because we don't know where things are at. So anyway, children's ministry is you know we don't see until later. It takes a while to see uh, um, the effect. Did you ever notice the um, we also almost always focus on the early verses in Psalm 22? It begins with mm -hmm. the first one, you know, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? We all know mm -hmm. that. Psalm 23 or 43? 22. 22. 22. 22. 22. 22. But the end of the psalm is really great, the great missionary psalm, beginning at verse 22 of Psalm 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. I will fear the Lord. Praise him. Um, and, and then um, in verse 27, all the, the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. Kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. And um, then at verse 30, pros, proste, uh, posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the congregation, they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people as not yet born. That's, that's us. Mm. We're the people that are not yet born when this was written. We're going to hear this message. We're going to be the recipients of that righteousness. We're going to hear it. And then it's our responsibility to proclaim it to others. What is it that we're going to hear? The last... Four, five verses, five words are amazing. That he has done it. Mm. That, that's the whole message right there. What is salvation all about? He has done it. Jesus has paid the price. Paid the sacrifice for our sins. He has done it. And now it's our responsibility to tell everybody else about it. All right? Look at the, um, let's turn to page 13 in your notes. Just want to go over a couple things real quickly. I'll point out one or two new things and then um, let you look at this uh, little quiz that I put together for you. We talked about um, paragraph number two there. What about the Husa verses in the Bible? I think we talked about that last week. You know, what about those verses where God says, "Whosoever will may come"? Is that a legitimate offer? Is that a legitimate invitation? God has chosen some. Can He make that offer to everyone? <clears throat> well, the answer is that God also ordains the means to <clears throat> how that invitation is going to be presented and 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 accepted. So. Um, anybody who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, is is uh, will receive the salvation that God has offered. It's a legitimate offer, but of course the Lord knows that not everyone is going to uh, is going to respond to the offer. But to those whom He has called and um, who He has regenerated. Uh, they will re respond. And of course, for us as, as human beings today, we don't know who these people are. So, of course, for us, it's yes, whosoever will may come. But we preach the gospel to everyone because there's going to be some in that group that will respond. We don't know who they are. As far as we're concerned, they're whoever. So that's our responsibility to preach the gospel. 
I'm going to go to paragraph number three at the bottom. If God is sovereignly in control of everything in history, how can he hold men responsible for their sinful acts? Doesn't this make God the author of sin? You touched on this before in the past. Very easy to show that that is not the case. Um, God knows everything from beginning to end because he decreed what's going to happen from beginning to end. It's not just foreknowledge, it's, uh, it's, um, it's predestination. He has planned for things to happen exactly the way he wants. As human beings, um, we want to have the ability to make a choice. We want to think that our choices matter, that, that we can decide for ourselves what's right, what's good, what's best for us. And, Especially in the United States, um, we are we, we we believe that the world's a democracy, that the majority rules, uh, consensus is right. So you know, if there's enough people that say it's got to be this way, we think well, that's the way it's got to be. God's not ruling by a democracy. God says this is it. Obey it or else. Um, a lot of the choices are taken away from us, but from our perspective as believers, that's a good thing because we know that if it wasn't that way, we never would have made that choice for the Lord. The, the, the way to explain all of this or to support it from the scripture is very, very easy. Did God plan the death of his son? Of course he did. In Isaiah 53 and many other places in the Old Testament we see that the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was God's plan from the very beginning. Did evil men carry out the execution of Jesus? Absolutely. Acts chapter 2 holds those Jews and, and, and Romans responsible for executing the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Did God for, uh, coerce them, force them, manipulate them to do what they did? Absolutely not. No, he, he, knew, he knew what happened. Yeah. They, they were making an absolute free choice to do what they wanted. They wanted to kill this man, and they did it. Does God hold men responsible for the death of Jesus? Absolutely. In, in Acts 2, it says that as well. You killed the Lord of glory. I think that's how it puts it. So God is never the author of sin. He's not res responsible for the sinful choices that we make. Um, and, and praise God that he's able to take those sinful choices off often and turn them into something that's good for us. That's Romans 8.28 and um, a lot of other places in Scripture. Kathy and I were just finished up reading Genesis and uh, we got to chapter 50. You know, the story of Joseph in Egypt is just an amazing, an amazing story. It's quite a, quite a country. But then, but then you get to the, the middle of chapter 50 and Joseph says, you know, you guys meant all of this for evil. Mm. You threw me into the pit. You want to sold me into slavery. You wanted to get rid of me. You meant it for evil. Mm -hmm. God meant it for good. Okay. God used all of that. And, and if we need to go through and to see now what's going to happen, you know, what, what good came of this? Well, Israel is in Egypt where, where God wants them to be now. And, and, and Pharaoh, now the Pharaoh who doesn't know Joseph, rises up and he brings all the slavery to the people. And the people are working hard and, and, and all this. And God raises up Moses. And, and Moses is slave. The whole story of Moses being saved out of the water and being raised by, the, by Pharaoh's daughter and his own mother that's mother, nursing and caring for him. And, and Pharaoh's paying her besides. After he issues a command to kill all the baby boys. It's just incredible. God, you know, you, you mean it for evil, but God takes all these things and weaves them together. It's a tapestry. You know, we see the front of it. We see the finished picture. You look behind the rug and all these pieces of thread are woven all over the place. God's put it all together into something beautiful. So, God's not the author of sin but he holds us responsible for the choice that we make. So here's the, here's the bottom line that a lot of people trip over and just can't figure out. Um, how do we reconcile the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man
for his own free choices. How can God be sovereign and make a choice that pleases him and, and, and yet God holds men responsible for, for their choices that many times include a choice not to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ so they will be condemned forever. How do we reconcile these, these two things that seem to both be taught in Scripture, God's sovereignty and man's responsibility, which they are. They're both clearly taught in Scripture. Mm -hmm. But they seem to be contradictory terms. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the answer is that these are what John MacArthur calls parallel truths. Parallel truths. Parallel truths. <coughs> Meaning that they are both true, but they're running parallel to each other so that you could extend them out for a million years. And what does parallel mean? They're, they're never going to meet, right? Run side by side. Yeah, they're never going to come together. The train tracks look like yeah, they exactly. go together, the but they don't, right? Yeah. If the train tracks spread, you know, even a little bit, the, the train spreads. The train wreck, yeah. Parallel, perfectly <laughs> together. Both of them absolutely true, but they're never going to come together. Meaning that in our minds as human beings, we're never going to reconcile all of these issues. It's just one of those inscrutable things that it says in Romans 11, that we're just never going to be able to fit all the pieces together and say, well, this is exactly how God did it. We might like to think that, and, and we, we can see a lot from Scripture, and we can come up with a, 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 a plan in our minds that, that seems to answer a lot of the contradictions, whatever. I mean, I don't have a problem with, with any of this anymore because this is, this is my fallback position. God's, did, God's done this, and I'm responsible for this, mm -hmm. and they don't line up all the time, but mm -hmm. they're both true. And, and, and the thing to remember is that last sentence there, it's a contradiction in our minds, mm -hmm. but it's never a contradiction in God's mind. He knows exactly what he's done, and it, it makes perfect sense to him, and maybe he'll reveal it to us someday. Isaiah 55, God's ways are not our ways, his thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are so much higher than ours. How can we expect to think the way God does? We just can't do it. I, I, I saw on some YouTube video not too long ago, some... Arminian is talking about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he said, Calvinism can't be true because you got these two contradictions. It's, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's an oxymoron. And, and he, the Bible can't leave us that way. They, they, it can't, can't be that way. That there's, just, there's two of these things that contradict you. But there's a contradiction in the whole system. It can't be true. Until well, the Lord takes me home, I'm going to find that out. <laughs> Right? No, I'm just saying you, because <laughs> you don't know. I, I think as believers, as humble believers, there are some things we need to leave with the mind of God and say, He understands and He knows it and He does what's best. And if we don't understand it, that's fine. Yeah. We'll, we'll find out someday. So, I... I you know, I, I don't have any problem with God chose someone to be saved and someone else he passed over. Um, why he made the choice of one and not the other, that I have no idea. God knows. So. In a way, that knowledge just gives us the peace instead of batting our heads against the wall wondering, you know, which is it? Well, yeah. God's in control, right? Yeah. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. Exactly right. And um, uh, that, that's something that took me a long time to learn, is that the, you can really find peace in any circumstance. I mean, you know, mm. we still have to go through the potholes at times, but, uh, you know, just knowing that uh, he's in charge is just that is layer that? of memory foam or whatever it is you need to mm. lay on and feel comfortable, you know? Yeah. Oh, you're exactly right, Bruce. I mean, you know, our church here has gone through you know, several 
up and down. Deaths and some very untimely deaths in the last four or five years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Terry being one of them and uh, Rick Simon Bru and, Bruce's, uh, and uh, others. Uh, and, and you know, what, what comfort do you have to share to the family yeah. when something like that happens? Well, some people think it's a cliche, but I, I, to me it's very comforting to say this was God's will for your family, for your husband, your wife, whatever it was. Yeah. And God always does what's right and good and perfect. And even if we can't explain it exactly, we can take comfort in the fact that what happened was not an accident, it couldn't have been prevented. God did it for His reasons, and that ought to be enough for us. Mm -hmm. I love this uh, quotation at the bottom of page 14. Because the death of Christ is sufficient for everyone, no one is left out except those who refuse this gift. Mm. Of course, we would all have refused this gift apart from grace, but God is not held responsible for this sinful condition. On the day of judgment, human beings will have one, have no one to thank for salvation but God, and no one to blame for condemnation but themselves. That's good. If we're in heaven, it's because of God's grace and we praise Him for salvation. If someone that ends up in hell and thinks about these things, he's got no one to blame but himself because he did not believe. Not because he wasn't chosen, but because he did not believe. That's the choice that he made. That leaves us all the more free to share and boast about the right things. The only difference is that on the day of judgment, human beings will have no one to thank for salvation about God, like I did Jack Diddley. <laughs> I mean, I was, Ian and I were talking to our older sister about the gospel and trying to explain Jesus and Christianity. She's asking different questions. So, just got done. So, if sin is so encapsulating, you know, none of us can do anything about it. She was talking about Christians judging people or responding to, very harshly to things. And, and I'm like, the only thing, the only, the only. The only thing that my broken feet can stand on is the fact that I've got my, I've got my crutch being my, crutch being my Jesus, and that's the only, only difference between a Christian sinner and a sinner mm -hmm. is what Jesus did. That's mm -hmm. it. Yeah. On the day of judgment, who do I have to thank? I can't thank myself. Right. I, uh, I come in and kind of level the playing field a little bit, and I say, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm no better than you. Mm -hmm. uh, so and so I'm talking, about, but I'm better off. Because of Jesus Christ, and can I explain that to you? I don't know why that is, but I try to, you know, let it down. <laughs> Sometimes I say, you know, but the, uh, I'm a Baptist. So I'm at a Baptist church. Back to Baptist again, right? But I said, but I, I kind of get in there. And it's an attention getter. It says, you know, Baptists were kind of like a bunch of mutts. I'm like what? You know, and I come in and say that Baptist church is like mutt. You better find out, you know, what's going on in here because they're all over the place and. You know, they might be over here and over here, but you got to. The point is, you got to get to somewhere where they're preaching the, the truth and the word. You know, the full truth has to be 100% truth. If it's got a lot of truth and then they're off in error a little bit, well, guess what? The whole thing is out the window. It has to be. When the clock hand is at 12 o'clock, it's got to be at 12 o'clock, not one minute of, one minute after. Yeah. And uh, but you, you, know, you know, just reading Luke, you know, starts off and. O Theophilus, the certainty of what's going down. I, mm. uh, I went out and interviewed him. Mm. Being a good Greek, you know, they, they love to know yeah. the facts, you know. So it's, yeah. it's, anyway, this was all part all of right. class, right? It's important, right? All this discussion? Yeah, sure. So I got some terrible questions there. <laughs> Couldn't can't help about Judas, reading about Judas over and over again, and you know, Satan entered into him. But uh, yeah. And because Jesus you know, allowed it, right? he knows what's going on. Somehow Judas repented before he killed himself. Just interesting. So I, I don't know if there's a lot of discussion whether he's, you know, 
a believer or not a believer, even though he did the task that was needed to be done. I mean, it's, it's right all the different camps we talk about. So, just an example. Mm. Yeah, I mean, Judas is a very interesting character. And, mm -hmm. um, fact that he was with Jesus for three years as the other disciples were, and yet he, he was the rebel, uh, I guess he shows that um, clearly in any church there's all kinds of people, it's always a mixed multitude right. in any church, any group of believers. Yeah. Um, but, but Jesus... Jesus trusted him. Jesus used him. He was the treasure. He had a right. super yeah. important role among the disciples. And yeah. the Lord knew what he was going to do. Yeah. 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 I just think, like, yeah, I don't know if it's a comparison, but, you know, how Peter, his, his human sinful condition, you know, seeing what's going down and denied him three times, predicted, but yet it strength, seemed to strengthen Peter. You know, he just knew, knew the truth of it, and then the churches started there, you know, to, yeah. and what a mighty guy in the second chapter of Acts, is that the same Peter, you know, well, it's loaded with the Holy Spirit now, it's a different Peter, you know, it's just, a, it's just interesting. So. I don't know if I mentioned it to you guys, and uh, tell me if I did, but I don't think so, but, you know, I think a very interesting study to do someday is to go through the Gospels and try to determine when the disciples were saved when they trusted Christ for salvation. Because it seems like right up until the cross, they still didn't have a clue. It's not until Acts 2 that we see this powerful group that's not ready to go out and take on the Jews and everybody else. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, Peter denies the Lord on the night of the crucifixion, and the others, where are they? They're nowhere around except John is there. You know, when, when did they really come to faith in Christ? Well, when, when, when Jesus yeah. called them at the very beginning, you know, come unto me, I'll make you fishers of men. Was that their salvation experience? They immediately dropped so. their nets. They were in the middle of fishing here. They could have been good fishing. Yeah. But they could have had fish in there. <laughs> I mean, the, the same, but just, they immediately dropped their nets in obedience. Like, uh, you know, just, yeah, I'm not sure that called. that was their salvation experience. Though. Yeah, because well, for all the other times, I mean, so many other times in the Gospels, we see them not having any understanding at all of who Jesus, the, 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 yeah. the boat in, in the Galilee when the storm comes up and, and Jesus, don't you care if we perish? And he calms the storm and they're saying, oh, right. who is this? Right. Who's in the boat with us? Right. They have no idea. And even Peter steps out in faith, but as the humanist comes through, that would happen to all yeah. of us. Yeah. Get out there, oh, you know, they start to have the doubt, you know. But you have in the accounts even Christ asking them, like, who am I? Or who yes, say that I am? Yeah. Well, you, you are the Christ. Yeah. Which is not to tell anyone. But then at the same time, then they follow up in yeah, other funny. instances after that, and yeah. they're like, they're asking questions again. Or doubting who, who his, his, his power right. and his deity. So, yeah. anyway, I'm sorry to get off on a tangent all the time, but I'll let these other guys better move along. Next Sunday, hope you guys are going to be here begin new the next section on ecclesiology. You know, a copy of the notes that uh, yep. Pastor Lee prepared for you. If you want to, chapter 9 in MacArthur's Systematic Theology, okay. Ecclesiology, it's only about 100 pages, not quite a long <laughs> as salvation. You still work out of it. want to start reading that, you can do that for next week, and um, we'll start talking about the church next week. All right, got a little quiz for you then. Okay.